Thank you so much for joining me today. We are in our series, New Kingdom People, and we are looking at the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous of all the sermons that Jesus preached. But before I get into it today, I wanna to just prepare you with something. We are gonna be taking communion at the end of our time together. So if you'd like to, right now, just slip out if you can and find some bread of some sort and some juice of some sort and have them handy because that way at the end of the service, we can take communion together. Okay, so if you wanna run out and do that right now, that's great, come on back. While you're doing that, I'll just say a few things about where we've been in this series. 
You know, the Sermon on the Mount is really giving us a very practical look at what it means to be the people of God, to have Christ reigning in our heart. It's almost as if he wanted us to know that his kingdom was not just an ideological concept. It wasn't just a philosophy. His kingdom actually changes the way we live. It changes our daily experiences. It starts out with our relationship with him. We recognize our spiritual poverty. And then it moves forward from that. There's a, there's a natural despondency or mourning that comes with the realization of who we really are. And then from there, there's a, a natural humility and a new pursuit of righteousness and, and treating others righteously and uh, on and on. Last week, we looked at mercy and, and what that really looks like. And today, we're going to be seeing how it affects the way we uh, come across to people. When we are when Christ is reigning in our hearts, we can be authentic. We can just be who we are. And that's the whole point of where he's going next. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It means that we're just truthful. We're just who we are. We're not putting on pretenses, of trying to be something that we're not, trying to look better than we're not, which was the problem that Jesus kept having with the Pharisees, which is why he called them hypocrites because they were trying to put on this front that they had it all together when they didn't. And we all know that we don't. The truth is, when we really get honest about our insides, we recognize there's all sorts of ways that we get off track. Um, I wanted to begin with just a cool, I don't know, thing I learned just recently. My wife, Lori, set me up with a podcast about Ludwig von Beethoven. I thought I knew a little bit about him. Like, I knew that he was an incredible musician. He's probably one of the foremost musicians of the late 18th and uh, early 19th centuries. Uh, I knew that he had gone deaf at some point in his life, and I assumed his greatest works were probably before he went deaf. But then I listened to this podcast, and I learned a little bit more about his history. The truth is, while he was a genius, even from childhood and very popular early on, something happened when he went deaf. He went deaf at about age 30. And that's when all the sounds around him and the sounds of the day were silenced. Up until this point, Ludwig von Beethoven's music sounded very similar to everybody else's, including his teachers. But when all those other sounds were silenced, it's like it just birthed something in him. And all of his best works, his most powerfully known, best known works and, and powerful works like his Beethoven's Fifth Symphony all came later in life after he had gone deaf. I came across this great article by Arthur Brooks on Beethoven. It's, listen, he writes, it seems a mystery that Beethoven became more original and brilliant as a composer in inverse proportion to his ability to hear his own and others' music. But maybe it isn't so surprising as his hearing deteriorated, he was less influenced by the prevailing compositional fashions and more by the musical structures forming inside his own head. His early work is pleasantly reminiscent of his early instructor, the hugely popular Joseph Haydn. Beethoven's later work became so original that he was and is regarded as the father of music's romantic period. Now here's the line that just really caught my attention. Listen. Deafness freed Beethoven as a composer because he no longer had society's soundtrack in his ears. Listen to that again. Deafness freed Beethoven as a composer because he no longer had society's soundtrack in his ears. When I heard that, I thought there is a corollary here between his experience and our experience as followers of Jesus. It's, it's almost like as we allow his kingdom reign to take over our life, we march to a different drummer. We hear different orders. And that's what this Sermon on the Mount is all about. It's almost like Jesus is saying, this is my manifesto. This is what will guide your life if my reign has taken hold of your heart. The more time we spend in quiet and reflection with God, the more we begin to operate according to his values. Otherwise, we just listen to all the noise around us in society and we react like everybody else. But Jesus is saying, no, if you're listening to me, you're going to react differently. Um, the Sermon on the Mount is like a new soundtrack for our lives. 
And it comes with the voice of Jesus Christ, with his spirit in our heart, guiding us, comforting us, and changing us, changing us into the character of Jesus. So now, listen to Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, with that as a background. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed, happy, filled with that shalom are those that are seeking to be authentic because they, they will be people who see God. You know, a lot of times in our culture, we think of the word pure. We just think of like moral purity. But really what he had in mind was much, much broader than that. Uh, the, the Greek word for pure is katharos. And it means clean, clear, authentic, or transparent. Our word sincere is a, is a compound uh, of two Latin words, sinna, which meant without, and sera, which meant wax. Now, why would we get our word sincere from two words without wax? Well, it's based on something that happened back in the Roman world. In ancient times when statues were made, and there were statues everywhere in the ancient world, uh, if somebody was really good, there wouldn't be any cracks in their statue. But a lot of statues were made by guys that weren't that good. And if you weren't that great at making statues, what you would do is, when it was finished, you would take some wax and sort of fill in the cracks. And then you'd put a fresh coat of paint, and it looked as good as anybody else's. And it worked. Until, of course, you hit a really hot day, and the wax would begin to melt, and then the truth would be revealed. There was all sorts of cracks. So when they were selling statues, they would advertise them, Sina Sarah, without wax, which is now why we can see, okay, the word sincere is very similar to that. It means just being truthful, being who we really are. Being authentic doesn't mean that we have to reveal everything about ourselves. If you came over to my house, I wouldn't, in the name of honesty, just take you into the kitchen and show you the garbage can underneath my sink. It doesn't mean that we have to tell everybody everything uh, about ourselves. It just means that when we do talk, we're being authentic. We're just being who we are. Um, it's a striving for in integrity rather than striving to impress. I was thinking about this idea of, of integrity and I ran across something I thought was kind of funny. Mike Adams, a professor at Eastern Connecticut State University, he did a, a lot of research on this one fascinating issue. Namely, the huge number of students who have life-altering crises which prevent them from taking exams on time. In fact, the primary life-altering crisis that was hitting most kids when they get to these exams was their grandmother dying. In fact, he showed with statistics that grandmothers are 10 times more likely to die before a grandchild's midterms and 19, more, 19 times more likely to die before final exams. In fact, worse, grandmothers of students who are not doing well in class are even at a higher rate of risk. Students who are failing are 50 times more likely to lose grandma than non-failing students. So it turns out that the greatest predictor of mortality among senior citizens in our day ends up being their grandchild's GPA. I read that and I thought, you know what, the moral of that story is, if you are a grandparent, whatever you do, don't let your grandkids go to college. It'll probably end up killing you. Integrity. That's what he's talking about here. And that's what Jesus was getting at. Just being truthful being who we are. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who are sincere, without wax. When it comes to purity, I'd like to think with you about just maybe three arenas where I think purity is very essential, okay? So the first is sincerely seeking God. You know, that's what God wants more than anything, is for us just to come to Him honestly and, and seek Him. Uh, we use the term, with my whole heart. You might, have, you might have even said in the past, I've given my heart to Jesus. It's actually not a bad term because it's really getting at the crux of the issue. You're bringing your truest self to God. The heart is used in scripture over and over to, to talk about the center of us, that animating part that, that shapes our lives and attitudes and convictions and ultimately our actions. It's the deepest us. 
that, that truest us when everything else is stripped away. Luke chapter 6, 45 says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The heart is the center. It's like, the, it's like a, an operating system in a computer. You don't usually even think about it until it gets messed up. And here Jesus is saying in Luke, yeah, what happens in your heart is ultimately going to come out in your life. Author Dane Ortland writes, when the Bible speaks of the heart, whether Old Testament or New Testament, he's not speaking of our emotional life only, but of the central part of, of all that we do. It is our motivation headquarters. The heart, in biblical terms, is not part of who we are, but the center of who we are. Our heart is what defines and directs us. That is why Proverbs tells us, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So when we say, I've surrendered my heart to God, we're saying, I've surrendered my whole life, my motives, my past, my present, my future, my mind, my values. Everything belongs to Him. One singular love, one allegiance, one king, and one kingdom. And that's what Jesus was getting at here. We're purely His. Jesus explained later in Matthew 6, 33, He said, but seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. He's saying everything else about life will take care of itself. He will guide that process. But our role is to seek God first and all that is right according to God, and then he'll take care of the rest. C.S. Lewis wrote in his book, The Joyful Christian, the Christian way is different. It's harder and easier. Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. No half measures are any good. I don't want to cut off a branch here and a branch there. I want to have the whole tree down. Hand over the whole natural self, all the desires which you think innocent as well as the ones you think wicked, the whole outfit, and I will give you a new self instead. I will give you myself. My own will shall become yours. There's three passages that I came across that I thought really help us to, to think about this idea that God knows us entirely. He sees who we really are. So there's no point in putting on pretenses. One's from Jeremiah, Jeremiah 17, 10. It says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind. Think about that. There's nothing you can think, nothing you can feel that God doesn't already know. Daniel chapter 2, 22, he says that God reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness. And Hebrews 4, 13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, if you think about all that, that would just be terrifying. And I think that's where some people just stop. They just think, man, I don't want God knowing everything about me. That's kind of scary because, well... If they're being honest, yeah, that is kind of scary. But we have to remember who this God is that knows us inside and out. He loves us like a father. He cares for us like a shepherd. He's the one that calls us friend, and he's the one that invites us into this intimate relationship because of what Christ has done on the cross on our behalf. So this God that knows us is also the God that loves us. And we always have to combine both those realities. He doesn't just know us. He knows us and still loves us. That's what's amazing about the love of God. It doesn't just love the part of you that you bring to church on Sundays or, or the part of you that, that you present to the world. He loves you even with all the stuff that he knows about you. And that's what should draw us to him in repentance and then in rest. Um, <clears throat> and then it says, you know, these who are authentic and seeking God, they will see God. So in other words, we really get what we want. If we are seeking to really be honest with God and have that pure relationship with God, then Jesus says, one day you will actually even see God. And I think the idea here of seeing God is more than just in the future, we're going to be in his kingdom and we're going to see him as he is. I think it means that we will know him. We will see him. The idea of seeing in scripture was, was always tied up with this idea of knowing 
And kind of like we say here at Encounter, encountering God. That's our goal, that we might really encounter the living God, honestly, from our heart. Psalm 24 expresses it this way. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. Think about that, what he's saying there. He's saying that the one who's pure is one that is trusting in God alone, isn't looking to something else uh, for their support. He's not trusting in an idol or swearing by a false god. Instead, they purely are devoted to God Almighty. Um, there's a second arena that I think we need to think about when it comes to purity, and that the second is being honest with myself. Sometimes it's very difficult to be honest with ourselves. We want to kind of cover over the parts of ourselves that we don't like that much. Carl Jung came up with a term he called the shadow side. It's to refer to our dark, kind of unknown side, or at least a side that we don't want to know. Uh, Mark Twain said, we are all like the moon. We all have a dark side. But there's something very freeing when we just admit that, that yeah, I'm a sinner, and so is everybody else. It, it puts us in a place where we can be helped by God because we're not trying to put on a pretense. Um, self-honesty is self-reflective. I've told you before that one of the things that a practice that I started years ago is at the end of the day, I just take some time to think back over my day and reflect. Where did I honor God and where did I get off track? Where was my heart not right? Um, but that time to self-reflect is so important and it, it helps us be honest with ourselves. Another author wrote, because God loves us unconditionally, along with our dark sides, we don't need to dodge ourselves. In the light of this love, the pain of self-knowledge can be at the same time the beginning of our healing. James wrote, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. What's he getting at there? He's just saying, don't be split-minded or split-souled. Uh, that word in Greek is dipsukos, just means split, sold. Don't have your soul divided. Bring it, to, bring it to the Lord as you really are. And, and you know, this whole thing is, it's not about that we are perfect. It just means that when we think about ourselves, we are being honest with what's there. I love that uh, imagery of a double-minded man. I don't want to be double-minded. I want to look into my own heart, look into my own soul, and bring what's really there to God. I want to be honest about what I see there. And that leads to confession. It also leads to humility. So being honest with ourselves is so, so important. Psalm 51, it's the cry of David after uh, he's, he's been an adulterer, he's been a murderer, but he wants to be right with God. And he comes and he cries out and he says, create in me a pure heart. O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. I love that. He recognizes what's really gone wrong. He recognizes the truth about himself, and he just cries out to God, create this pure heart in me. So I think that tells us something about how we get to purity. We don't work ourselves there. Purity is a result of confession. It's a result of being honest with ourselves about what's gone wrong and how we've gotten off track, and then coming to God and allowing him to forgive us, allowing him to, to pull us close. David Jeremiah wrote this, there's a tremendous relief in knowing that God's love for me is utterly realistic, based at every point on prior knowledge of the worst about me, so that no discovery now can disillusion him about me in the way that I am so often disillusioned about myself. In other words, there's incredible hope for those who are disappointed in themselves. And I'll be very honest with you, sometimes when I look at my own day in that time of self-reflection, I'm not really happy with what I see. But that's what makes confession and God's grace so profoundly wonderful. We could fall into that and just allow Him to cover us with His grace so we can be honest with ourselves. And then just one more, real quickly, one more crucial realm where, where purity makes such a difference, and that is relating with on with authenticity, with other people. In our relationships, we're authentic, without wax. It, it doesn't mean we have to share everything. It just means that as we relate to people, 
We aren't trying to impress them. We're not trying to put on a mask. We're just being who we are. Brennan Manning, some of you know that name. He battled alcoholism all his life, and he wrote some fantastic works. Uh, one of my favorites is The Furious Longing of God. But before he died in 2013, he wrote this in that book. In the place of our woundedness, we construct a false self. When I was eight, the imposter or false self was born as a defense against pain. The imposter within whispered, Brennan, don't ever be your real self anymore because nobody likes you as you are. Invent a new self that everybody will admire and nobody will know. There's a great deal of misunderstanding about this word hypocrisy. You see, it's rooted in the, the culture of the of Greek, the Greek dramas, the Greek theater. And, and what would happen back then is that these actors would play various roles. So they would come out on stage with a mask. They would be holding up a mask and, and act out of that mask. And then they'd go backstage and get a different mask and come out and play a different character. And so this word hypocrisy, it really means uh, hypo, hippo, or under, like a hypodermic needle, hypo, and then Chrissy is to speak. So literally the, the word hypocrisy rose out of this idea of speaking from behind a mask. And that's what Jesus was getting at when he told the, the, the Pharisees that they were being hypocrites. They were speaking from a false place, a false self. They were speaking from behind a mask. And he said, that's what irritated him most. He just wanted them to be authentic to be pure. Hypocrisy is deliberate deception, trying to make people think we're something we're not. Sometimes people misuse the word. They'll say, oh, you know, about somebody that maybe disappointed them. Maybe they see a Christian who's not acting very loving. So they'll say, well, that Christian is a hypocrite. But the truth is, that's not really hypocrisy. That's a person who didn't live up to their own ideals. And none of us do, not even the person claiming that somebody else is a hypocrite. Hypocrisy is intending, trying to present a false self, trying to look like somebody we really are not. Um, so relating with authenticity is very, very important. So we have to keep watching ourselves to make sure that we're just being who we are, not trying to impress, not trying to use words that like people will go, wow, they're so smart or they're so innovative, just being real with people. And I've found that just in working with people, that is really all people are after. They're not looking for perfection. They're just looking for an authentic person. Reggie Campbell, author of Radical Mentoring, wrote, I must catch myself doing image management. Stop it and immediately be real. If I only show my mask, people can only love the mask and never know or love me. I will never feel love without exposing the real me to those who can love me. So blessed are the pure, pure from the inside out, people who are seeking to authentically walk with God, people who are being honest with themselves about what's going on in their life, and people who strive to relate with authenticity when they are with others. I wanna take communion with you as we close this time. So let me just have a word of prayer with you, and then we're going to take the bread, and we're going to take the cup together, and then I'll close in a word of prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, I want so much for this part of the Sermon on the Mount to work its way right down into my heart. I want to be a person who lives out of that authentic, real self, not the false self, not impressions, but Lord, who I really am. And even if that disappoints people sometimes, help me to just be that real person. I pray that we as followers of Jesus, we keep striving for this. And we do look forward one day, Lord, as we seek you, as we, as we want to know you better and draw closer to you. It is so exciting to think that one day we will see God. We will get what we're after. We'll get what we've longed for. We'll be in your presence so help us, Lord, to be on the authentic journey with you, bringing you our real selves each day, allowing your grace to wash over our failures and draw us close to you. 
And when we're with others, Lord, I pray we'd just be real. As real as we know, we know how to be. And when we're not, to, to just change course and set the, salt, the false self aside and just seek to be honestly who we are. And Lord, now as we think about communion, we just thank you for this bread that represents your body that hung on that cross. That you died in our place. We thank you for this cup that represents a brand new covenant between God and man. And we, as we take this today, all of us who take this together, we're coming to you, confessing to you our desire to be right with you. And we are remembering once again what it took to bring us into relationship with you. We thank you, O oh God, that you took away our sins by Christ's death on the cross. He paid the price which gives us entrance right into this relationship with you. We don't make any pretense today, Lord, about being righteous. We don't make any pretense about bringing you anything, bringing anything to this transaction. We simply come empty-handed. We come knowing we are sinners. We come knowing we need grace. We come looking to you, God, for your healing to take place in our hearts. And we do so with thanksgiving. So now we take this bread and we take this cup remembering our Savior. Let's take it together, family. And let's take the cup. And just pause for a moment and think about what that really means for you, what your relationship with Christ is all about. So let's just take a moment and reflect on that, and then I'll pray. Lord God, thank you for these quiet moments when we can stop and think about what's most important. Thank you for your amazing love for us. With everything else going on in the world, it's so easy for us to get our minds and our hearts distracted from you, to follow after other loves, other idols, other pursuits, to the point of excluding you, setting you aside or making you, putting you in kind of a box. But I pray that we would let you out of that box, Lord, and that your, the truth of who you are would invade us completely. We would follow you wholeheartedly we keep bringing our minds back to the truth of who we are as your kingdom people. Help us not to get too distracted by the things going on in our world, news headlines and concerns about the pandemic, concerns about the economy or concerns about anything else. But Lord, ultimately, we just bring ourselves to you and allow you to carry us through whatever, whatever's ahead. We just thank you, Lord, that you do. You love us that much. You know us, and you still love us. We live on that reality. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, family. Have a good week.
mind.